Amen. I want to put a tag on this particular text. And for the next few moments, I want to talk to you with your prayers, with this thought in mind. It's your turn. You see, it's the beginning of the new year. And um, I just have a a sense uh, and a feeling in my spirit that it is your time. It is your turn. I believe that you're next. Is any, anybody ever remember when you were kids saying stuff like, I got next? You remember that? Well, look at somebody and say, I got next. I got next because it's your, your turn. Have you ever been in a dark place? All of us, no matter who we are, have found ourselves from time to time in a dark place. I'm not specifically talking about being in a dark place physically. You can be in a dark place mentally. You can be in a dark place emotionally. No wonder Robin Williams said, the the torment is so much, I can hardly bear it. The price is too great that I can't take it any longer. Robin Williams also said, there's something that happens to me every time I do stand-up comedy. He says, it it has to be demonic. It's like they take over me. And then he said, when it's over with, I am in such a state of depression that I want to take my life. And eventually did. No wonder Tupac declared, now I'm lost and I'm weary. So many tears. I'm suicidal. Don't stand near me. You know, both Williams and Tupac was in a dark place spiritually. They were in a dark place mentally. And all of us from time to time find ourselves down, depressed, distressed, despondent, despairing, and discouraged about things around us. And soon the spirit gets within us. That spirit gets within us. And before you know it, we are in a dark place emotionally. But not only in a dark place emotionally, you can get into a dark spot and a dark place spiritually. No wonder some in scriptures declare, if God is with us, then why has all of this happened to us? The reason that they said that is because they were in a dark place spiritually. When someone declares, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? They are in a dark place spiritually. We see very quickly that that happened to Jesus. It happens when what you believe, watch this now, when what you believe about the the God that you serve, who is supposed to be with you, is contradicted by everything that is happening around you and to you. When everything that you believed to be this way, but yet it's happening this way, you find yourself in a dark place. When you're in a dark place, you've got to be careful For you can make decisions that will cost you more than you really want to pay. I'm sure you've heard the story about the plane, the small aircraft that um, that uh, had some trouble. It was it went dark. It lost its power. The engine had gone out, and the pilot went into his small cabin of of the small plane and looked at the three passengers. One was a Boy Scout, and the other was a priest, and the other was a, a famous scientist. And he said, I've got bad news, and I even have some worse news. He said, the bad news is it's dark, and the power has gone out. We have no engine power, and the plane is going down. He said, that's the bad news. He said, the worst news is that we only have three parachutes on this plane, and yet there are four of us. He said, now I've got to be honest with you. I would go down with the plane." But I've got a young wife and a newborn baby, and it just wouldn't be right. It'd be a terrible tragedy for my young family for me to go down with the plane. So I'm going to jump and pray for the rest of you. So he grabbed a parachute, and he jumped out, and that left uh, two parachutes and three people. Well, the next one, the brilliant scientist said, well, I'll tell you what. He said, you know, I would go down with the plane. However, I am the smartest man in the world. He said, I'm so smart, I became the scientist of the year, and, and so therefore, guys, you're on your own, and I might say a prayer for you on the way down. So he grabbed his, and out the chute he went. 
Well, the priest looked at the young boy scout, and the priest said, well, you know, the way it really is is I, I'm, you know, I'm older. I've lived most of my life. You have most of your life ahead of you, so most of my best days are behind, so I'm just going to let you take it, and I'll just stay with the plane. The boy scout said, well, listen, there's no need in worrying. Not at all. He said, the smartest man in the world just grabbed my backpack and jumped out the, the <laughs> hole in the plane. He said, so we're in good shape. <laughs> uh, what had happened in that is that in the midst of a crisis and in the midst of a dark space, he made a bad decision. Now, I park there because if you're not careful, listen to me, if you're not careful in the midst of your own darkness, does anybody know anything about darkness here? In the midst of your own darkness, you can make some bad decisions. But if you've been in a dark space and in a dark place, all of us have done some stupid and dumb stuff, haven't we? All of us have made some decisions where we should have turned right but ended up going left. All of us from time to time find ourselves in darkness. It is typical in darkness to go to sleep. In the darkness of 1963, Madeline Mary O'Hara single-handedly took prayer out of the school. We got caught asleep again in 2015 when the Supreme Court okayed same-sex same -sex marriages, which opened the door to all kinds of evil and darkness, things that most of us don't even think about. Because with that came transgender rights. Hello? And believe me, there's a lot of that. I walked down Market Square one day, and I was going to do a little video. This has been several years ago with um, the, some of the video team. We were going to interview some people, and this this woman, what I thought was this woman, looked like she'd come from a beauty pageant. She had one of these banners on, and it said, it said, Miss Rodeo 2012 or something. I forget how many years ago. And I thought, well, there's a nice lady. Let's we'll just interview her. <laughs> and I, I walked up to her, and I said, do you have a minute I could just a ask you a question? She had these two big bruisers with her, these guys, you know, and, and she looked like, I mean, he, she, it, what, I don't know. They looked. I mean, it looked nice until I got up, and then when I asked him, and then when I said, when, when I asked her if she would ask one of them, what, if they would say something, I said, I'd be glad to. <laughs> and I, I jumped back, scared me to death. I'm honest to God, I had no idea. <laughs> and then I find out from somebody else, well, this is the day they have the, the gay march in, in downtown. And I thought, really? I said, well, why didn't somebody tell me that before I come down here? But what, what had happened is literally is that opened the door to transgender rights. And now it has opened the door. It's getting, getting much wider into now we have the, the bathrooms on, on uh, uh, state and uh, ca campuses. And like the University of Tennessee is called gender neutral. And what that means is that anybody, anybody whatsoever can use that bathroom. Uh, even if your children are around there and they need to go, they can go, they have, they can go in there with them. I'm, I'm telling you, it opened up a lot of crazy stuff. And so we're living in dark times. The church has had its uh, come by y'all moments that have, I think, insulted the bloodshed of our ancestors who founded this country on Judeo-Christian ethics. And something is wrong when a deranged, fugi, thug, bully, moron can hit you over the head with a bat and be out of jail and back on the street before you get out of the hospital. Something's wrong with that. Can you say amen? So we've, we've been in darkness, but I have received an invitation, hallelujah, from the Board of Education to perform an operation on the world. But I have received an invitation to perform an operation on the world. Can you say amen? amen? But according to our text, Heaven's Hero, it's just been 
Jesus has just been through a, a, a season here. He had been attacked by the, uh, the adversary in the, and in the midst of adversity. He, he's been in the wilderness there. He's just come off of a fast and the enemy uh, starts tempting him. So he comes out of the wilderness, Jesus did. And, and the Bible says, having come out of the wilderness, he then gets word that his cousin John the Baptist has been treacherously set up He's been betrayed. He's been put in prison. And with all of that going on, now can you imagine after a long fast of 40 days and 40 nights and after being tried and tempted by the enemy like that, can you imagine getting bad news that someone has set up a family member of yours and, 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 and you've just gotten word and, and you're perhaps the only one that can help them. And, and, and so, you know, you know, you just got off the fast. You thought everything would go smooth, but it seems like things have gotten worse. And with all that going on, Jesus, says it's my turn now this is where I'm getting the thought from and that's why I've got to hang out here a moment because Jesus had been attacked by the adversary he had been in warfare in the wilderness and the Bible said because of what he had been through he was ready for God to do something through him and I'm here because I believe with all of my heart that the Holy Ghost has taken some of you through some things because he's getting you ready for some bigger things that he has for you in the near future now I would love to stay there and hang out there but I, I, I just for the sake of time I want to move on you see Jesus seen an opportunity and he says now it's my turn see I, I let me let me just park there because let me just take take some time to uh, uh, to think about that and recognize that whatever you have been through listen to this God has been using to set you up for what God wants to accomplish to accomplish through you so if you think about everything you have been through in the past few months, perhaps even a few years now, but you're still carrying some of that, you've heard me say it, and you're like, well, I'm still waiting for it. I'll believe it when I see it. Well, listen to me. There's going to, be, there's going to have to be an element of faith on your part where you're going to have to start calling things that aren't as though that they are. And you're going to have to say, hey, you know what? I'm not leaving here today until I settle the issue in my mind that it's my turn. That it's my time for my thing from my God. It's your turn. See, if you've been attacked, can I talk to you right here? If you've been attacked, but you've held on to your integrity in the midst of innuendos. And by the way, innuendos are murderous. Then it's your turn. If you have come through hell and high water and discovered that God will give you a round trip ticket and he's brought you back through the hell and high water and set your feet back on dry land, then it's your turn. If you find yourself having grown through what you have gone through, then I've got good news for you. It's your turn. If you've been through some stuff and you've come out stronger than you were and wiser than you were and better than you were, then I came by to let you know that it's your turn. I still ain't got you. Can I go a little further? If you've been through some stuff and now because of what you've been through, you are closer to God today than you were then and then you were yesterday than you were before you went through that, then I'm here to tell you, guess what? It's your turn. Why can't we just go ahead and give God a praise for that? Come on, shout, it's your turn. Come on, let's get it in our spirit. It's your turn. Now, I'll be honest with you, I could dismiss right here and tell you that it's over, that, hey, that's all I really had to say today. And to be honest with you, it really is all I had to say to you because all I could hear the last couple of weeks is it's our turn, that 2016 is our turn. It's covenant life's turn. Turn, and if you are a part of this church family, then it's your turn. Well, I don't feel like that. Well, listen, as your faith is, so be it. You need to adjust the feeling to fit the fact. It's like the, it's like the two people that got married. They got married. He walked out the door, got into the lobby, and, and, and he looked at his wife. He said, well, you know, I don't feel married. And she said, well, look, bozo, you're married. <laughs> See, you've got to adjust the feeling to fit the fact. Well, what do I do with these feelings? Well, did you know that your feelings will lie to you? And as long as you live by your feelings, you're going to have a miserable life. The Bible says, set your affections. 
set your affections. Whatever you set your affections on, that's where it needs to stay. So what are you setting your affections on? Are you setting them on an offense? Are you setting them on anger? Are you setting them on disappointment? Are you setting them on, on, on the divorce? What, whatever it is, you make the choice with your own life where you set them. So all I came by to tell you today is that you got next. Uh, it is your time. It's your turn. Because if you look at what happened in verse 11, look at, look at verse 11. With, I think they got it on the screen. Now. Watch this. In verse 11, the Bible says the devil left him, left who? He left Jesus. Okay? And the angels came. Uh-huh. And the angels came and they what? And they ministered to him. You know, isn't it just like God to send an angel at just the right time? You know angels, don't you? Oh, you know about angels. Surely you do. You know angels. You know, you know angels, don't you? I mean angels to encourage you when you're discouraged. You know angels. You know the ones that he said were sent to minister to the heirs of salvation. You know angels, don't you? Don't you? I mean, you act like you don't know angels. Do you know angels? Angels do the right thing uh, when everything has gone wrong. Anybody ever had an angel show up uh, to your right side uh, and help you and show you in your life uh, at just the right time and kept you going when you felt like giving up? Does anybody know anything about angels? Uh, did you know that the Bible says, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware angels you've got angels hallelujah the Bible says in the Old Testament that there was a ladder called Jacob's ladder and the angels would run up and down the ladder angels would run up and down the ladder. they would run up to heaven and get stuff and run back down and bring it down run back up and get stuff run back down and bring it down aren't you thankful that we got angels aren't you thankful that God has angels that are ministering spirits to assist him and ministering to the flock of God Angels. See, the Bible says after all of what Christ had been through, he then gets the word that John, his cousin, has been treacherously set up. Uh-huh. Because people will set you up. Oh, yeah, they'll set you up. And now, and is now, he's in prison, and Jesus makes a move, the Bible says. He departed, and he goes up north geographically, and he says, in essence, it's my turn. It's my turn now. I mean, the, the devil's tempted me. He's done all this to me. I've been through the fast. I've, been, I've set aside. He isolated me so he could revelate me, and he did that. But now it's my turn to shine. It's my time to shine. i got to hang out right here because that's all I'm trying to let you know. Note with me the fierce urgency of the now. And I'm quoting Martin Luther King, who had a fierce he had a fierce urgency of now as in, I've got to handle some business right now. I've got to do it right now. One poet said this, I have only just a minute, 60 seconds in it forced upon me. I can't refuse it, don't seek it. Didn't seek it, didn't choose it, but it's up to me to use it. I must suffer if I lose it. Just a tiny little minute, but eternity is in it. Amen. You see, he recognizes the fierce urgency of the right now. And that's all you have is the right now. And what I'm trying to teach and what I'm trying to speak and get in the spirit of this congregation is that now is our time. We can't sit on our blessed assurance any longer. We can't sit on our hands and let everybody else do it any longer. Now is our time. We must understand the urgency that is at hand. All you have is right now. You ain't got no time to wait for something to happen. You got to make something happen. All you have is right now. I, 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 I'm loving this. The Bible says that Jesus recognizing the fierce urgency of now, he then, if you read on in the story, he announces the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So he leaves where he has been and he, he goes down there to where John has been in prison and he brings the gospel to them. There's an urgency for people to hear the word of God. There is a famine in the land of the word of God. 
Because if people knew the word of God, they wouldn't do some of the things that they do. So there's a real famine of the word in the time that we're, we are living in. But the Bible says that Jesus goes down to where he's at and in the town and he starts saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now right now, I'm loving this because Jesus gives us some lessons and I'm only going to give you one, but he gives us some lessons here when we know it's our turn. So if you want to know if it's your turn, you need to write this down. Lesson number one, the Bible lets us know, you know it's your turn when you discover injustice that happens to another sets up a movement for justice for all. Now, I know that's a lot, and that might be a lot to write down, so maybe you have to just kind of, kind of paraphrase it and put it down, but let me explain. Injustice may happen to another but have you noticed that anytime injustice happens, it instigates and inspires. It pushes and it prods a movement of justice for all. Our text says in verse 12, John is put into prison. The language of the Greek New Testament is crazy because in the Greek it suggests that there is was some kind of treachery in how John has been set up to be put in prison. In other words, theologians and historians believe that John was denied due process. As we know, prison is always used as a tool of oppression in the hand of an oppressor. And so the Bible lets us know that John is set up. Ain't a lot of things changed over the years. Some of the same stuff that happens now, it happened back then. He's thrown in a prison without due process. And when Jesus heard about his cousin and what happened to him, I love what he did. He did not say, oh, man, what a shame. Oh, shucks. Bless his heart. We'll pray for him. I'll have the church pray for him. He'll be all right. We'll just start a jail ministry while he's in there. I love it because Jesus heard what happened and, and John, the text says, listen to this, he departed and went straight off the stage, straight down to the hood. It was one of the worst areas of that day. It was, it was, a, it was I mean, it was a bad place. And he says, John has been put in prison. I can't break him out. But what I can do is fight for justice and liberation on my end here. Amen. Are you with me? Every now and then, God will use and allow your ears to hear about injustice. Not for you to say, uh, ain't that a shame? Boy, that's sad. I hate that that happened for him. But hey, better luck next time. No, 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 no. I, 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 I got I to go ahead and, and, and preach this thing like I'm really feeling it because, see, I guess, I, let me just give it to you like this. Have you ever thought about the fact that when you look at how Kim Davis, that Ashland, I believe, I believe it's called Ashland City, Kentucky, Kim Davis, the court clerk, yes. took a stand in Ashland, Kentucky, I guess it was, it was then and only then that the other court clerks and Christians began to rise up and rally around her. But until then, everybody just started giving in. Whatever. Y'all do remember that, don't you? While some looked at it as a lost, Christendom looked at it as proof that alienable rights of Christians were in jeopardy. You remember the Montgomery uh, bus boycott? December the 1st, 1955, Rosa Parks got sick and tired of being sick and tired, and she took a stand and refused to give up her seat. See, the bus driver calls the police. The police come, and they say, well, what do you want us to do? Put her off the bus or arrest her? And the clown said, put her off the bus, and then arrest her. And guess what the bus driver did? He went on about his business, but one rider that was on the bus said if, if he had just let her off the bus and, let it, and, and just been done with that, nothing would have ever changed. But he was such a clown that he had her arrested. And because he had her arrested, in just a few days, the word spread throughout Montgomery. And you know what they said? 
They said, you don't mess with that one right there. That woman don't take nothing off of nobody. And they've done arrested the wrong one now. And I like that right there because Rosa had built up such a reputation of being a rebel, rebel and a revolutionary with a cause that someone heard that Rosa had been arrested and said, don't allow them to take her identity because she's been victimized by identity theft because we've now tried to reduce her to some little tired, meek, mild, sweet little seamstress who was just physically tired that day and wanted to ride the bus. No, 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 no. Listen to me. She wasn't physically tired about nothing. She was just tired of being pushed around. Come on, somebody. She was tired of cooperating with injustice. And because Rosa did that, Rosa says, I'm not going to put up with this anymore. And you know why? Because there were other black folk on the bus. And when the bus driver said move, guess what they did? They got up and moved. I've always wondered when they saw when they saw her being arrested, why they didn't just get off the bus with her. And I couldn't understand that, but then the Holy Spirit quickened me and said, don't judge her, and, or don't judge, don't judge them, because the world and the church is full of people sitting on the sidelines watching everybody else do the work. I just said a whole lot right there. Well, I was going to work, but nobody asked me, since when do you have to be asked to work in your own house? Rosa gets arrested. The community leaders then organize what is called the Montgomery Improvement Association in the basement of a church there in Montgomery. And they said, we need a spokesman. We need a president. we gotta, we got to appoint somebody. Finally, a man by the name of E.B. Nixon looked at Martin King, who had, had only been at the church there for about a year, and he says to him, said, listen, you haven't been here long enough to be bought and paid for yet. So we're going to appoint you. Well, Word has it, history has it, that, that um, King was a, a, a little bit uh, took, taken back by that and a little bit offended by how he had approached that. But nonetheless, he said, uh, you know, I, I, you know I, I, I just can't do it. He said, oh, yeah, yes, you're going to do it. Well, King said, okay, he gave in, he did it, and he got pushed into being a civil rights leader. Now, listen to this. Jesus hears that John is arrested and now he goes, and watch this, he goes to Galilee. Galilee of the Gentiles. Galilee, which is the hood. Galilee is the rough part of town. Galilee, which is occupied and oppressed by the Roman Empire. Galilee is a space and a place that is very dark. I'm loving this because Jesus never let a tragedy go to waste. He says, that injustice over here is making me fight for justice for everybody else over there. Amen. You ain't getting this. God can let you hear about an injustice in order to inspire you and instigate you to fight for justice throughout the land. And that's what's been happening in recent days. As a matter of fact, it's our history in this world and in the Word. You all know what happened when, when Rosa, when it was heard that she had been arrested. It started the Montgomery bus boycott, which lasted 381 days. And watch this. The movement for justice shut down segregation and travel. One act of standing up for your rights. See, there was an incident of injustice that took place one Thursday night as Jesus went to the judgment hall, uh, to, actually went from judgment hall to judgment hall. Do you remember that? It just, it just, it just kept, kept going. It went from one to another. He died one Friday, but he got up on Sunday because injustice over here launched a movement for justice everywhere else. This is good. This is real good. See, I, I'm going to go old school. I, 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 uh, and I'm getting excited because I, I, I've, been, I've been eating and sleeping and drinking this thing, thinking about it. Anybody ever watch cartoons anymore? Guess not. I don't blame you because I can't understand these new cartoons. I, they, I, it don't, they don't make any sense to me anymore. I mean, them cartoons, they used to be so good. So I'm an old school cartoon guy, but these new ones, I mean, gosh, you know, the best cartoons are just old school cartoons. You know, old school cartoons like Underdog. 
Anybody remember Underdog? Underdog was hip hop before hip hop was cool. He would rap all of his words. He'd say, when Polly's in trouble, I am not slow. It's hip hip and away I go. <laughs> you remember that? Anybody remember that? Huh? I do. And then there was Bugs Bunny. Anybody remember Bugs Bunny? <laughs> What's up, Doc? He was real shrewd like that. And then you had Tom and Jerry. Tom and Jerry was one of my favorites, wasn't he yours? And then what about Mighty Mouse? Here I come to save the day. A small mouse could swoop at the big cats away. I mean, I'm like, I'm liking Mighty Mouse. But I also love, and my favorite, I just have to admit, is Popeye. Popeye the, sa Popeye the sailor man lived in the garbage can. Is that the way it went? No, that was a bad rhyme I learned at school, <laughs> elementary. Forget that one. <laughs> I'm just checking to make sure you're awake out there, okay? I like Papa, but, but something tripped me up about Papa. Papa had this woman. Papa had his own boo named Olive Oil. Olive always had men after her. She looked like nothing. I mean, she was as, uh, she, she was so ugly. She could stop a clock, she was so ugly. I mean, she had no bangs, she had no color in her hair, she had no makeup, she had no weave, she had, she had, no, she had no back. I mean, she was just straight as a stick and, and wore the same outfit all the time. Every show, it was like she had the same outfit on. But what she did have is she could keep a man now. And she was always getting in trouble. She had who? Who? Um, Br was it Brutus or Pluto, Pluto or Pluto? Well, which one was it? You are throwing them all at me. Brutus. Okay, yeah, okay, 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 Brutus. Brutus and Popeye. I'm not sure if it's Brutus. It might be Pluto. It's Pluto. Which one is it, Angela? She's going to look it up. Everybody, hold on. <laughs> Melvin, you are a mess. <laughs> uh -huh. Papa the Sailor Man. Which one was it? Bluto. Bluto. Yeah, yeah, Bluto. Okay, so you got Bluto and Papa always jonesing after her. You know what jonesing is, don't you? Jonesing on olive, olive oil. That's old school, okay? They, they, were, they were after her. They wanted her to be their gal, and she was singing, all the single ladies, all the single ladies, all the single ladies. All the same. She, she should have put, hey, listen, they, one of them should have put a ring on it, right? And so Brutus grabs her, beats down Popeye, and in the process takes off at olive oil. And after he, after he did that, he throws this big boulder or rock or something at Popeye, hits him, smashes him against the wall, okay? And then out comes this can of spinach. It just kind of flies up and he catches it and then he turns it up and, and I'm about to shout you right here and he says, I've had all that I can stand and I can't stand no more. You guys saw the same one I saw, didn't you? Uh-huh. And I'm trying to let you know maybe that's what some folk need to do. They need to wake up in the United States of America and say, I've had all I can stand uh, and I can't stand no more. I'm tired of this political lizeization of our education, of our children. Uh, so our children are being either miseducated or educated and set up uh, in the school or uh, maybe some of it a prison pipeline. But I've had all I can stands and I can't stands no more. Maybe some of y'all need to get a Popeye anointing and pray I've had all I can stands and I can't stands no more. Maybe there's a mama here that needs to get a Popeye anointing and say, devil, you've took advantage of my babies for the last time. I've had all I can stands and 
I can't stand no more. Maybe there's a preacher. Maybe there's a teacher. Maybe there's an elder or a deacon that might say I am not sitting back another day longer and letting the devil run shod with sickness over the church family anymore. I'm called to be a gatekeeper and I'm going to stand right here in the midst of whatever it is that I'm going through and I'm going to tell the devil I've had all that I can stand and I can't stand no more. You see, the Bible says that people, in our text it says that the people sat in darkness. You remember? It says they sat in darkness and then they seen a great light. Now I've got to go, but let me just leave you with this, okay? Sat in darkness. Say it with me. They sat in dark. Oh my God. Listen to this. It literally means that they had been in darkness so long they just adjusted to it. That's exactly what's going on in our country and that's exactly what's going on in Christendom. I've been in the church a long time. I've been in the way a long time. Yep, you've been in the way, all right. You're either in or you're in the way. You got to get in. Do you know you can adjust to the darkness? Did you know that you can get so used to being depressed that you can just stay depressed all the time and that becomes your mindset? Did you know that you can get used to being broke and just say, well, you know, I'm broke. I'm used to being broke. I'll just always be broke. And when we start like racing, we start speaking that stuff over our own lives. And next thing you know, it, started, it starts bringing curse on our lives. And then next thing you know, it's passed down from generation to generation until somebody stands, somebody stands up and said, I've had all I can stand and I can't stand no more. You You'd be surprised at how many people I prayed with that had family members that were alcoholics three and four generations back, but they said, you know what? I can't stand this spirit that has destroyed my family. I don't want it destroying my family that I'm going to have. And so I'm drawing a line in the sand right here and I'm breaking that spirit of alcoholism. I'm breaking that spirit of drug addiction. I'm breaking that spirit of gambling. I'm breaking that spirit of, uh, 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 of lying. I'm breaking that lying devil spirit in the name. I'm breaking that Jezebel spirit in the name of Jesus. It's not going to control and manipulate. I've had all I can stand and I ain't standing no more. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Here's, here's what happens. Here's what happens is that we get so familiar with the darkness that we just think that that's just the way it's going to be. They were so complacent. They were so complacent. They sat in darkness, but here comes Jesus. And I love the text. It says that when life goes dark, make sure you bring your own light. And you can usher in the dawning of a new day. There it is. There's your shot right there. Because life is going to go dark. But somebody ought to bring your own light. Don't wait for somebody else to bring your light. Quit waiting on the next Martin Luther. All right. Come on, somebody. Amen. Don't wait for another Rosa Parks. God wants to use covenant life to be game changers. God wants to use every member of this body to be a difference maker in the world. Okay. I guess I'll give it to you like this. Bring your own light to the party. Because when you bring your own light, God will use it to get rid of the darkness that is going on and all you got all you do is know is that it's dark in the world but guess what if you bring your own light i'm trying to say bring your own light i'm, I'm trying to let you know you got to bring your own light and the only way that you can bring your own light is to make sure that the light is shining on the inside of your life the bible says that the spirit of a man is the candle of the lord and how's your candle burning is your candle burning bright uh, 
Are you a light? Uh, are you an example? Are you are, are, are you are you brightened up, or is it dim? Is the oil still there? Do you got any oil in the vessel anymore? Because it don't burn without any oil in it. How's the oil? Have you checked your oil lately? Is your tank filled up? I like it how Bo said it yesterday. He said sometimes you got to put the drill back on the charger, and you got to get charged back up. Uh, and every now and then I got an old flashlight that I have to put on a battery charger and it charges back up and then it burns bright again and that's exactly what has to happen in the life of a child of God we have to get back on the charge hallelujah we need a Holy Ghost charge uh, we need the kind of anointing uh, that breaks the yoke kind of charge we need an old fashioned devil defined demon stomping Holy Ghost revival that puts the devil to flight can you say amen Oh, hallelujah. Oh, y'all forgive me because I, 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 I'm feeling my freedom. I don't know what happened. But I, 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 feel, I, I feel like something broke over me this week. During, the, during this, this time of fasting, I feel like something just broke. Something broke off of me. Something during trying to attach itself to me. Something that's trying to oppress me and depress me. And yesterday I felt like that thing just began to let go and the talons began to let go of me and people were praying for me. I, in fact, I, I texted Brother Rodney and I said, Rodney, I, said, I, feel like, I feel like God's done something to encourage me today, to, to, to just strengthen my spirit today. And, and, and then it dawned on me. I talked to somebody else and somebody else was getting that fight back in them and getting that drive back in them. Because you see, what the devil wants to do is he wants to oppress us. You know what oppression is? It's beat you down. He wants to just kind of beat you down. And sometimes we'll let what people say beat you down. And sometimes we'll let what people do beat you down. But the Lord reminded me that no weapon formed against his children shall prosper. The Lord reminded me that the gates of hell can't prevail against the church. Uh, the Lord reminded me, if he be for me, then who? Y'all ain't gonna help me preach at all today, are you? All right, all right, it's too cold for you. It's too cold, Guns are so cold. Is it cold in here? No? Does anybody want what's next? Does anybody? I want to say, I'm next. I'm next in line, Les. You with me over there, Les? I'm next. I got next. I've been waiting a long time. So I got next.